1 Peter chapter 3, we will be in verses 18 through 22 this morning. Humanity by nature is sinful. Now, psychologists will tell us that man is inherently good, that there's good in every man, and you can find that good, and we have to somehow motivate that good to come out of every individual. That's what psychology tells us, the study of human nature. The Bible tells us that there are none good, there are none righteous, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so by nature, man is inherently evil, sinful. And yet, when you know that to be true, in light of our sinfulness and evilness, God was still so loving and caring that he sent his son to die on the cross for us, which just blows me away, that God would do that even though I have turned my back against him. Didn't want anything to do with him. Didn't want to listen to him. Didn't want to walk in his ways. And yet he still sent his son to take my place upon the cross. Christ is our example. He's our example of suffering. And as the example of suffering, we can find hope and grace in time of need when we are suffering. As Hebrews tells us that we have a high priest who has been tempted in every point who understands our infirmities and our sins and even our temptations. And so we can come to Christ upon our knees and pray and have communion with him, knowing that he loves us and he understands the things that we're going through. Last week we left off as we've been talking about suffering. Peter said in verse 17, For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good rather than doing evil evil, that if we are to suffer, let's suffer for being righteous. Let's suffer for, for, for sharing the gospel. Let, let's suffer for walking in the right way. But let's not suffer for doing evil. Let's not be judgmental in, in the sense that we're over judging people and we're judging their very hearts. But let's be fruit inspectors, righteously, gently, and lovingly. Uh, let's make good decisions, especially during tax time. Let's be honest. Let's give Caesar what's Caesar's and let's give God what is God's. And then we come to the next verses as he continues on with this thought of suffering. And Christ is that example of suffering. So if you'll read with me these verses so we can kind of get the context. Because these verses are challenging for many of us and what Peter is really trying to say here. And so let's read from verse 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, namely, baptism. Then he says, within these parentheses, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him, that is, Jesus Christ. We've been talking about the sufferings of Christians. As you know, the context here during this time that Peter is dealing with the believers at that point have been suffering for their faith. Nero is persecuting the Christians. Caesar is bringing these Christians into court and he is pretty much sentencing them to death, taking the husbands and the wives and even children and and really putting the blame upon them for what he has done because he has tried to build his kingdom. And so the Christians, because of their faith and their love for God and for one another and their fellowship and even their communion and partaking of the Lord's Supper has all been ridiculed by the government and by society. And so this great amount of pressure and stress and persecution has been upon them. And during this time, it can be overwhelming to an individual who is suffering like this to give up hope, to give up hope. I don't know how many times I have seen Christians who are being persecuted or who are suffering in this life, whether it's their fault or not, but just suffering itself 
really can cause a hopeless life, can cause an individual to be stressed out, depressed, and really have no hope. As a believer, it shouldn't be like that. We should be different. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He has paid the penalty of sin. He has made a way for heaven. Our home is there. And so we should be rejoicing even during the time of suffering, though I understand it's difficult. See, we have people watching us. The world is watching us. And they want to see the joy in your life. They want to see the peace in your life. You're telling them Jesus saved you and that he made a way to heaven. You're telling them that you have this peace and this joy, but are you showing it to them? Do they see it in your life? See, I was challenged by that lately. Where a relative said concerning me that I really don't have peace. That I really don't have contentment. That I'm just hiding it behind the curtains. And like me, this is what the person, like me, who has no peace and unrest and doesn't have any direction and things are falling apart, his life is falling apart too. That's how the world thinks. Because they are going through these things, they think everybody else is going through it. And even though you show this great joy and this peace, they still think you're hiding it from them because you're human and you have to be going through this stuff also. And we need to really make sure that when we are going through these things that we make it clear to those around us that, yeah, it hurts. If I pinch you, you will hurt, right? You'll scream, right? You're not going to go, oh, praise God. You, know, you don't do that because it hurts. But you don't sit there and go, wow, I'm going to be depressed for the rest of my life because he pinched me. Life is over. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not going to eat. You, know? you don't get depressed. You go, okay, praise God it hurt. It's over. Lord, I'm still going to heaven. There's still a purpose. There's a plan for my life. And so you have this joy in, in your heart and in your spirit. And we really need to show that to others, even while we are suffering. It's important because Christ did. <clears throat> that scene, <clears throat> Passion of the Christ, it's not biblical, it's not in the scriptures, but it always touches my heart because it is true. Uh, that scene on the Passions of the Christ, when, when all of a sudden he falls down with the cross on his shoulders and Mary comes to him, you remember that? And, and, and she's like crying and weeping, and all of a sudden he looks up at her and says, Mother, I'm making all things new. And it was like this joy in his heart, like like. Forget the suffering. Forget what I'm going through. Mother, don't you see I'm making this, all these things new for everyone? He was excited about what was taking place in his life. And that, that just rips me apart, you know, that in the times of suffering, sometimes we're just going, God, where are you? You know, where are you at? Why aren't you here? And he's there. And so we really need to pray about this area of our Christian walk. We should be excited. We should be happy. I should be. I'm not always I've been through a lot <clears throat> with my hip and my injury and dealing with it, being in bed, you know, every single day. It seems like now I'm getting better and I'm less in bed. But before I was in bed all day long, every day, right after church, go home, get in bed because it just was painful. And there was even a time where I wanted to give up. I'm just laying there, Lord, just take me home. There's no use for me. I can't live like this. But then getting up and displaying the joy, displaying our faith in Christ and so forth, we need to do that to this dying world. They need to see that in us. And it has to be real, right? Not fake. We can't be fake because they're going to see through the fakeness. And so it has to be real in our, in our hearts and we need to pray about that. So let's look at the sufferings of Christ. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sin the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Christ also suffered. Is that true? Of course it is. The day that Christ walked down there to the Jordan River and John the Baptist baptized him, the Son of God, behold, the Son of God, and then the Father's approval with the dove and so forth coming upon him. From that point on, they begin to persecute him. They begin to tell lies about him. He calls himself the son of God. He makes these claims of destroying the temple and in three days he will rebuild it. And they begin to trap him. If you believe in God, then what about taxes? Do you pay your taxes? And of course he would say, show me the coin. <clears throat> whose, whose symbol is on there? Whose image is on there? Well, Caesar's. Then give to Caesar's with Caesar's. God doesn't need Caesar's money. 
or resources and give to God what is God's. And Jesus was saying to them, basically, look, take your money, give it to Caesar, but give to God what is God's and your heart is God's. And he wants you, so give him your life. And it was a plea from Jesus to them, give him your life. But they trapped him. They ridiculed him. Even in the garden, when he knew that he had to go to the cross, the stress and the suffering was so intense as he was praying that he began to sweat blood because of that stress. He was mocked, he was ridiculed. His body was going through so much suffering. Then they took him to a trial in the middle of the night illegal, false accusations, slapping him in the face, and then taking his body, laying it upon a stump, and whipping and stripping his flesh right from his bones. Did he suffer? Of course he suffered. Tremendously. And then making him carry his own beam, if it was a beam or a cross of some sort, to the point where they would then hang him upon this cross with nails in his hands and barely breathing until the very end. And yet at the end, he cried out, Father, it is finished. It is done. No more suffering, no more pain for the Lord because he suffered for all. Yeah, he suffered. He suffered a lot. Now I've known the Lord for 26 years now, going on 27 years. And every time I think about the sufferings of Christ, it always gets me right there, doesn't it? Sometimes we forget what he has gone through for us. In fact, we become callous to it because we hear it so often. Every time you go to church, oh, the sufferings of Christ, I know that. Oh, yeah, but he suffered. Oh, I know that already. And so our hearts become callous that we can't allow our hearts to be callous to what he has done for us. Not that that is our focus point, the sufferings of Christ, but it truly does reveal his love for us, doesn't it? That he loved us that much to take our place upon the cross because we are evil. We are the ones that are sinful. We are the ones that should have been placed upon that cross. It was our sins that he took and bore. It was our iniquities, our transgressions. And so we should have hung on that cross, but he went in our place. That's love. And we should never forget the love that Christ has for us. Peter here is telling these believers, you suffered. I know, I understand that. And many of you are dying. But he suffered too. He suffered too. In fact, he suffered way beyond what you can ever imagine because the sins of the world were laid upon his shoulders. So don't lose hope, he's saying to the believers. Do not lose hope. Trust in God. Put your faith in him. Rejoice in that he paid it all for us. He said, the just for the unjust. In other words, here's Christ, who is pure and holy and just. There was no sin found in him. He was a lamb that was perfect, without spot, without blame whatsoever. And he was righteous. And yet he died for the unrighteous, the unjust. That's me, the unjust. I'm the sinner. I'm the one that failed. I fail in my relationship with my wife. I fail in my relationship with my children. I fail in this world as a pastor. I have sin. We all have sin and we all fail. So we look to Jesus who's perfect and pure and holy. And we have mercy and grace towards one another. Well, why did he do this? Because the next statement, that he might bring us to God. We were separated from God. Our sin separated us from God. Our wretchedness has kept us from a right relationship with God. The enemy has been involved. He deceived Eve, which brought sin into the world, which separated us from God. And Jesus came to reunite or reconcile us. The word reconcile means that we had a right relationship with God, but somewhere down the line it was severed. And it was no longer right. And that is what the enemy has done. And the enemy continues to do that. That's one of his plans. With your loved ones that don't know Jesus Christ, they're not reconciled with God. They haven't been brought to God yet. They don't have a relationship. Enemy loves that. And he will keep them busy with life, with the world, or with religion, with wealth, with their relationships. Uh, he, He will keep things going in their life so actively that they don't even focus on God and what God has done as long as he keeps them away from God so that they're not reconciled to God. And we have to challenge them 
and asked him, have you been reconciled? What are you talking about? Have you been reconciled to God? Or do you have a religion? Are you working your way to heaven? Do you think you're going to heaven? You know, most people, even those that work for their salvation, will probably, if they're honest, they will tell you, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Because they know their works aren't good enough. Even though they try, 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 and they think they need to try more, it's not good enough. And so our works don't get us to heaven. What only reconciles us is the work of Jesus Christ upon that cross. That was his mission, to bring us to God. What's our mission? The Great Commission, to make disciples of men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bringing them to God, introducing them to Jesus Christ. That is our mission also. Now, how did he do it? (laughs) Next statement. Being put to death in the flesh. That is, his body was crucified. It was murdered. He was killed for our iniquities. But he was made alive by the Spirit of God. Yet he died, yet he was alive. The word made alive is in the verb, passive voice, which indicates that there's an operation of an outside source of power. He was made alive, that is, by the power of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He was made alive. The Bible also tells us in Romans 6, 4, that it was the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And John 2, 18 through 22 tells us that it was Jesus who raised himself from the dead. And so we see the triune resurrection taking place there by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Though he died physically, his body was laid in the tomb, yet he was alive. So Peter makes that clear to them because many of them were dying. Remember religious leaders came and asked about the resurrection and Jesus basically said, look, uh, our father is the father of, of uh, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Now, why did he say that? Because they're alive. Because they're alive. They're not dead in the grave and dust. He was making a point to them. They are still alive. And they are with the father in heaven alive. So our God is a God of the resurrection. And so Peter is saying here, though you may die through your suffering, yet you shall live by the Spirit of God. And so we don't have to fear men, right? If they threaten to kill us. Go ahead. Take my life. What are you doing? You're just moving my address from here to there. You know, you're making it that much quicker. Hey, I'm ready to go. Praise God, you know. And before I go, while you're getting ready, loading your gun, let me tell you about Jesus. He loves you. Oh, go ahead. Take, you're going to take my life. Here, let me help you load the gun, you know. Go ahead. Here it is. No, point it right here, you know, because I'm ready to go, and I want to make sure you hit me right so I can absent from this world, present with the Lord, and let me just go. I mean, it's just that simple and that quick. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And you're sharing. We love you. I love you. God loves you. You're going to do something. You're going to regret it, but God loves you. Boy, do you think that would haunt them? It would haunt them to their grave if you were to die that way. It really would. I was trying to get that point across to a a young man that um, is related to me. Uh, He wasn't a believer at the time, but I I imagined if he was a believer and how he could have handled the situation differently. He lived in Chino. He was on his way home as he was every day from school. And as he was walking home, this car pulls up next to him and they cried out the Crips uh, gang logo and, and chant whatever it was that they call and he turned around and they looked at him and he just said you know hey I'm not with any gang and they jumped out of the car and they started chasing him and so he's running as fast as he can and he's trying to get away and of course they're just too fast they're in a car and they pull over and they put him in the hospital just almost beat him to death you know And, and it's sad that it has to go on in our world but it goes on in our world but I was thinking boy if he was a Christian how could that have changed Could it have even changed? Could he have had an opportunity to share the gospel with them while it was happening? Could you have the fortitude of mind to to, to share at that moment when you know, "Uh uh-oh, my life may end here? See, we have to prepare ourselves for that. We have to prepare ourselves today. 
as you read, it, maybe you haven't, but in our End Times newsletter, in the Obamacare, <clears throat> there is a, a legal term in there called the ICD 9E978 that nobody knew what it was about. Well, they found out that what it is, it's, it's um, giving all execution performed at the behest of the judiciary or ruling authority. If they deem fit that somebody is, is committing a crime or not in compliance, that they have the authority to execute you. This is an Obamacare. And by the way, one of the ways that they can execute you is by beheading decapitation. Isn't that interesting? The government has purchased guillotines. That sounds barbaric. Why would the government purchase guillotines? Because we're preparing for the end times when believers will be challenged to either stand up for their faith and be beheaded by these guillotines in front of many people. We need to prepare ourselves. Now, will we see that? I don't know. Some say no, we'll be raptured up. I'm, I'm a pre-trib and I think that we'll be raptured up, but can we see some of that? We could be. We could be very well, see some sort of persecution come upon, upon Christians. And we need to be ready with the power of God, the Spirit of God filling us. Now he goes on to encourage the believers here, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. <clears throat> so his point again, he's alive. Even though his body's in, in this tomb for three days, yet he's still alive. He actually went down to these spirits and he began to preach to the spirits in prison. Well, who did he preach to? Here's where the passages get a little difficult to understand. So we have to understand this, and I think that it's important that we understand the Scriptures, and that's why we go through the Bible, and we try to understand everything about what God is teaching us. What we're going to do is we're going to take an example of the Old Testament with Noah, and we're going to take the example of baptism, and Peter's going to give us an understanding of what those really mean spiritually. Uh, the example of Noah, for instance, um, you have a man who was commissioned by God to preach to the world that the end's coming to, a, to an end and that he was to prepare himself and those that would want to be saved through this end times event by building an ark. And in 120 days, the, the earth would be flooded and then they would enter into the ark and they would be saved through this water baptism in a sense. That's the historical account of the flood of Noah. And Peter is referring to that. He will refer to that in a moment. So giving it credence that it is true, it is a real event that did take place. And then we come to John the Baptist who get, begins to baptize by submerging you under water. And that is a ritual that we perform as believers to identify with the death of Christ on the cross, that we are dying to our old self and we're going to live for Christ now. We're making that choice of our own free will to identify with the death of our flesh. And we want to live for God in the spirit in the right way. Now he's going to take those two together and help us to understand how they apply to us today. The ritual and yet the spiritual significance of Noah and the ark. Now during the time of Noah you have these men, some believe that, that were wicked, evil men that were put into prison, Genesis chapter 2. They were so bad they were laying with, uh, with earthly women. We see that in Genesis 2. Some believe it's demonic, some believe they're angels. We, we really don't know. I have my own twist on it. But the point is, is that these men were then put into some sort of prison and that Jesus went down and he began to preach judgment upon them. Is that the case here? I don't think so. I, I think that when we look at other parts of the Bible, that we get a clearer understanding of what Peter is talking about. Now we know in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, both dying, they went to the center of the earth. One was in Sheol, or hell, or holding place. There was a great gulf which separated him from all the Old Testament saints and people who have died righteously. And they were separated by this gulf. You remember the story. In fact, this man was in torment and in pain. And Luke 16 tells us that he actually called out to Abraham and said, hey, can you just dip some water on my lips because I'm in pain here. And then the, the whole scenario of, of him saying, at least go to my brothers and tell them about this Jesus Christ, you know, and so forth. So here we see a, a description of, of 
those who have passed from this life, and by the way, the word prison doesn't necessarily mean a jail cell with bars. What it's saying is, is death, in a sense. And they were in a place, a holding place. So not that they committed a crime, though we all committed crimes, and we're all sinners, but they were there in this place. Death kept them there. So when we know that, and then we go to Ephesians 4, 8, where Paul says concerning Jesus that he ascended on high, he led the captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. This is all happening within that three days. Well, Jesus laid his body laid there in the tomb that he descended into the middle of the earth and he began to preach to the saints that were there the gospel message. He began to tell them it is finished, it is done. Remember the thief on the cross? The one that confessed and repented and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And so he probably went down with him and they began to preach and then they all entered into paradise together. That's what Peter is talking about, to encourage the saints. Again, you're suffering, you're dying, and you're going to a place that Jesus is going to preach or has preached and has opened up the doors to heaven and this paradise that is already for you when you pass from this life to the next life. Then he goes on and gets a little more difficult. Look at verse 20. Who formerly were disobedient, and of course we're all disobedient, we're all sinful men, whether he's preaching to the other side, and it could very well be. It doesn't say, we don't know, that's the thing, and, and nor does it give us who he preached to, nor names. So it could be the, that Lazarus heard the judgment in that gospel preaching to the saints that were there also. He says, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Who is the divine? The divine is God. The divine who had long suffering while in the days of Noah waited for the ark to be prepared. So God was having patience. The Greek word is literally long tempered. He waited. He wasn't quick to judge. Man and humanity was evil and wicked and God was waiting for the right moment when the ark was built so that he could bring judgment on the earth. Again, encouraging the saints. Look, I know you're suffering. Many of you are dying. God is patient. He's waiting for the right moment. Deliverance is coming. Hang on to hope. Hang on to Christ. And then the ark came. They entered into the ark. The floodwaters came in from the earth. And then six souls were saved because everyone else didn't believe it. No one else received it. Noah was a preacher of the gospel. He told them of what was coming. The world's coming to an end. You need to repent. You need to come with us. You get into the ark by faith and God will save you. But they didn't believe. It's one of the most frustrating things for pastors and even parents who love their children and want to see them saved is when they don't believe you. Well, what do you know? Do you know how long religion has been around? Why do I believe your religion over that religion? You know, and you can say, but it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Buddha is still in the grave. Muhammad is still in the grave. Jesus is alive. Oh yeah, I've heard that message before. There's no power. I see uh, guys who call themselves Christians and they're out there smoking, they're out there drinking, you know, they're doing these things. So what power is there? Why should I join something like that, you know? The divorce rate is higher in the church, you know? And it's so sad that the enemy has infiltrated the church and is really displaying this weak religious system. But there's always a remnant in that church. And the remnant is not about religion, it's about relationship. There are always a few that can be that example. That's why it's so important, guys, ladies, that we are examples while God is waiting to bring judgment on this earth. This world needs our examples in this world. You know what's infiltrating the church right now? Is drinking. It's a big thing. Can a Christian drink? And, and they're writing articles and books, and you're getting pastors who are drinking now and, and saying it's okay and smoking their cigar while they're preaching the Word of God and you know doing things like this. I mean, it may be okay, but is it appropriate? 
Is it sending a wrong message? Are we stumbling the world and believing that we're separated from this world, that we're different? Now, they're agreeing that, that if you get drunk, it's a sin. The Bible's clear. You get drunk, it's a sin. Well, what's drunk? The state of California says what? 0.8% is, is legally you're intoxicated. So is that the point? I'll tell you when. As soon as your mind is altered, that's when you're drunk. And, and for some of us, that might be half a drink. You know, it just all depends. And so where's that line? I don't think we even know where it is. You've got to be careful because then you're sinning against the Lord. And then you're practicing it. And, of course, the Bible says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're in trouble. Well, but, but, but Jesus created wine out of water. You know, not the same intoxicating potents that we have today. But, but Timothy, Paul gave him, you know, drink for his stomach. Yeah, for, for medicational purposes, not, not for social, you know, gatherings, you know. Get the context. Don't be deceived by the enemy because the enemy is like, oh, you have liberties. Enjoy your liberties. If our liberties cause someone to stumble, what did Paul say? Forget it. Don't do it. We need to think about those things, whether it's smoking, whether it's drinking, whatever it is. And see, the church is looking at us, and they're confused. Why should I join them? And it's sad that we're not in unity over these issues. You know. But God continues to work. And so while God's judgment is coming, you know, Noah's preparing, the ark takes place, and, and they're ready to get in. And by the way, there's a movie coming out called Noah with, uh, I'm, I already got it, Miss. Russell Crowe, I was trying to memorize that name. I kept thinking uh, Kurt Douglas or something like that. that. That would be a good fit for him back in those days. Be careful when you watch that movie. I would go back and read the account so that when people ask you questions, did you see that movie? You're a Christian, right? You saw that movie? Yeah, I saw it. And here's what I saw. You know, this and this and this and this. You know, if you see any errors, correct them. Tell them, well, the Bible said this. I understand the movie was nice. It, it really had the graphics, you know, and I saw one of the commercials where the water was really coming up from the earth, just shooting up. I think that's true. There's a lot of water in the center of the earth. They, they say, well, how could that much rain come down? What if it came out of the center of the earth and just flooded everything? And it makes sense because when the water then subsided, where did it go? The center of the earth just opened up and sucked it back in like a sponge. Makes sense to me. So looking at it and using it, as an opportunity to share the gospel with people. So Peter is using this example, historical event, to bring about a truth. Then he says in verse 21, this is also an anti-type, which now saves us baptism. Yet in parenthesis, he, he, he qualifies this by saying, not the removal of the flesh or the filth of the flesh, but, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. So he's not talking about the ritual baptism. He's talking more of the spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit here. Now the word anti-type, don't let that throw you off. What it basically means is a type or a symbol or a figure. And so the ark, the flood, it going through, what really saved Noah and his family? That they had faith in God, that God would save them through this flood. It wasn't the ark. It was God's word that he they would be saved if they built this ark went into it and endured it it wasn't the water the water they were submerged into it and in a sense baptized through this judgment in this world and they survived anti a type the word baptism is not necessarily the word the ritual of baptism but that they were emerged in water so which now saves us emerged in water, but not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but of a good conscience. Well, what is a good conscience? And how do you get a good conscience? And that's a good question. A good conscience comes from a conscience that's been reborn, that's been cleared, that God has given to us as Christians so that we know what is right and what is wrong. That when we read his word, we go, that is true, and I need to apply it. There are a lot of people that don't have a clear conscience. Their conscience is seared. It's hard. Whether they're saved, I don't know, or whether they are just cold to what truth is. I was talking with a, a pastor this last week. I went and sat down with him. has a big church here. 
thousands and we were just talking and fellowshipping and um, I mentioned to him about how, how different people are today in their relationship with Christ when they come to the Lord than, than back when I was saved or when he was saved. And he started to explain and share that, that we came out of a revival through the Calvary Chapel movement. The Spirit was moving in a fresh way. And people got saved and their lives just were transformed almost immediately. I mean, they went from black to white, you know. They went from, from not loving Jesus to just totally sacrificing everything for Jesus, you know. And it just seems like today that people are now being born again more out of the knowledge uh, of being taught by their parents. They grew up in the church, and so they're not experiencing this revival of the Holy Spirit. And so it's their relationship uh, and their growth is so much different and so much slower, than when this revival took place. Now, I don't think that um, it's necessarily a bad thing or that they're not saved, but I think it's something that, that, that they're comfortable in, but they don't have to be. I believe that if you really want to be revived, that you have a personal choice to say, Lord, revive me, excite me, help me to sacrifice my life for you, make me radical, Lord. And that's what we're hoping to do in these seven days of, of waiting on the Lord and worshiping in the upper room in prayer. We're hoping that revival starts with us first here in this church with the leadership. And then it trickles down to all of us so that we're looking for opportunities to invite people to church. Not that you're not, and I'm not suggesting that, but we're excited about that. That's what we need. We need a fresh moving of the Holy Spirit taking place in our life. That's what a conscience is. It, it knows it's been born again and, and it's aware of its surrounding. You know you have a good conscience when you're in a place that um, you shouldn't be. For instance, gambling. I don't think that, that Christians should practice gambling. And if you're in those places, your conscience should be saying, why am I here? Why am I in this place? I don't belong here. And you need to listen to that conscience. Your conscience will tell you. It's when your conscience doesn't say a word and you're, you're in there and you don't even realize it. You're enjoying yourself and there's no problem and, you know, and you're not even thinking about it. And then someone says something, you're going, wow, I never even thought that was wrong. Oh, boy, be careful because then your conscience hasn't been born again or it hasn't been quickened or alive and you need to really pay attention to that. And so what matters is not the ritual baptism. I believe in the ritual baptism. I believe in it. I believe that Jesus was very clear that we are to be baptized and we are to be obedient to that baptism as he commanded us to. It, it's, it's an example and it reveals our heart to God and our obedience to God. When I got baptized, I heard Dave Hawking on the radio and it was a rainy day. I was in my company truck and he said, you need to be baptized. In, in fact, if you've accepted the Lord, you immediately need to be baptized. And I'm I was like, I've never been to a Christian church, never met a Christian pastor. I had a few friends that were Christians, but I had no idea what all that meant. I remember being a Catholic, and I don't even remember being baptized in. My mom and dad took me, and they sprinkled water at me. I'm sure it got in my eye, and I cried. You know, but that's as much as I remember. I don't even remember the experience of it all. So I thought, I need to be baptized. So what do I do? You know, and of course, he told me that you need to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what I did was I jumped out of my truck, and it was pouring rain, so I'm like, Lord, I need to be baptized. Please baptize me. So I said, baptize me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I got soaked. I was drenched. And so the Lord baptized me. You know, I got baptized by God himself. What an honor that was. Of course, I felt it wasn't the right way of doing it, so I got re-baptized once I joined a church, you know, and the pastor did it in, in a pool. But I'm in a pool. I want to go to the Jordan River where Jesus was. So I believe in that, and I think that we should do it. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's important. How important is that? We need to not be confused that when the Bible says to do something, we need to do it. You know, there are churches today that will tell you that unless you are baptized, you're not saved. That's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that. Our salvation is based upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross alone. 
His suffering paid it all. Even our own suffering can't add to it. It's done. It's complete. And so when he asks us to be baptized, it's not a ritual that saves us. It's a ritual of obedience to us that we recognize we're identifying ourselves with Christ, that he suffered on the cross, he died to himself, so we're dying to ourselves, and we're going to live for God. That's all baptism is about. In fact, these churches will go, far, go as far and they'll start saying things like, when you get baptized, you need to be baptized by our church. And if you're not baptized by our church, then it's not a true baptism. And so you're going to hell because it's not our church. And they'll even go as far and say, when you are baptized, these words need to be spoken exactly. We baptize you in the name of Jesus. If you say it any other way, it's not a good baptism. If you say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh -uh, that's wrong. Wait a minute. Listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They need to read their Bible. need to read your Bible. That's why it's important that we're in the Word of God and understanding what God is trying to say to us. And so Peter then, again, is not talking about the ritual baptism. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the evidence that Jesus is alive, right? And so our suffering and our pain, though it may bring death, we too will be alive when we enter into heaven. Then it goes on and says in verse 22 that Jesus went to heaven and he's at the right hand of God, angels and authority and powers having been made subject to him. I find that interesting that it ends with subject to him because ultimately Jesus is in all authority. So Jesus, after he died, laid in the tomb, resurrected, he ascended to the Father, he sits at his right hand, which speaks of authority. Not only does he have authority in that seat, but he has authority over angels, over authorities, over powers, and they're all subject to him. And Peter kind of ends it with that fact that everything is in subjection to Jesus Christ. And so, wives, as you submit unto your husbands, you're submitting unto the Lord because the word of God says for you to submit to your husband. As we submit to our employers, we're submitting unto Christ because the Bible says that we're to submit to our employers. Husbands are to honor and love their wives because Christ said this, we are submitting unto Christ. In fact, all things are under Christ. All angels, all authorities, all ranks, everything is in subjection to Him. Let me close. The true baptism is a baptism of the heart, not a ritual. I pray that you would seek out a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on a daily basis where you are in communion with him, in fellowship with him, where you're talking with him on a daily basis. And he will begin to clear your conscience and give you a hunger and desire for his word, for his fellowship, and for his work, that you would get involved and be busy as we await for his judgment to come as the days.